Tonight's scripture reading comes from Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. That's Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. We welcome you. We're very glad that you're here this evening. A couple of weeks ago, we started studying about the return from captivity. Here's a little bit of a timeline to get us up to that point before we see the timeline on the slide. About 1,500 years before Christ, the law of Moses was given. That's when the children of Israel came up out of Egypt, went to Mount Sinai. About 400 years before that is when they went down into Egypt as just about 70 people. And then by the time they came up out, they were a large nation. They went through about 400 years of judges. I know these figures are disputed some here and there, but this is very approximate. And then about 1000 BC, 1100 BC, they got their first king, Saul. And then David, and then Solomon. And then the kingdom split in two, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And they had several kings, all evil in the northern kingdom. Several kings in the southern kingdom, many evil, but many that tried to do some good. The thing about that was the evil ones were just plain evil. The good ones, none of them, uh, some of them were a whole lot better than others, but some of them tried to do good, but still didn't remove the high places, still didn't remove the idolatrous places, and things like that. They're complimented in Scripture for what good they did, but not complimented for what bad they allowed to go on. And then, in about 722 B.C., the Israelites, the northern kingdom, was taken captive. 586 B.C., finally Jerusalem, capital of the southern kingdom, was taken captive. They had been told they'd be in captivity 70 years. The first captivity was 606 B.C. And then comes the change of the Babylonian Empire to the Persian Empire. You remember in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar gets the writing on the wall. And he is a, sort of a co-regent, a co-king at the time. And he gets the writing on the wall that the Babylonian kingdom is going to end and be overtaken by the Medo-Persian kingdom. Well, that's what happens. Cyrus the Great had been king in the, of the Persians from 550 on. But often in the Bible, the first year of Cyrus would refer to 536 B.C. because that's when he overtook Jerusalem. And the capital of, of Judea became a, a portion of the Persian kingdom rather than the Babylonian kingdom. After Cyrus came Cambyses for seven years. After Cambyses came Darius. You recognize some of these names from the book of Daniel and from what we're reading here in Ezra, Maya, Ezra, or Ezra and Nehemiah. After Darius came Xerxes I or Ahasuerus, whose name you recognize from the book of Esther. And then came Artaxerxes. Now, the foundation of the temple was laid in 536 B.C. when the first group of Jews came back. When they were first allowed to come back, several of them did. Several of them said, we want to go back. Others of them were not going back to Jerusalem just yet. But in 536 B.C., the foundation was laid. But then they let it sit. They were afraid of outside forces coming in. They were being bullied. And they allowed themselves to be bullied into not completing the temple. Until the prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to them and told them, you're sitting in your own houses and that seems fine. Why not build the house of the Lord? And Zechariah would give them comforting words that Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel who had started to build the temple would be the one to finish the temple. But even when it all got done, it would not be by man's might, not by man's power, not by anything that man did, but by God's spirit. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. That's where we studied last week. Then Esther comes, while many Jews had stayed in captivity, they apparently just became comfortable there, stayed there. Esther had lost her parents, she was in captivity, became queen eventually through the series of providential events. And then we get to the time of Ezra, about 457 B.C., where he starts to come back. Now he's been the author of this book, but we haven't studied him yet. We've studied Zerubbabel and the rebuilding of the temple, and then Ezra we haven't studied yet. Ezra will lead a return in 457 BC and then Nehemiah will come 13 years later and rebuild the walls. You remember those lessons from that. Well tonight we're right about here, 457 BC in Ezra chapter 7. You'll notice Ezra chapter 7 in verse 1. 
Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, and it goes on. But here we are, as you can see, in the reign of Artaxerxes. If you look down at verse 8, you see this. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. Well, if he started reigning in 465 B.C., his seventh year would be around 458, 457 B.C. They counted years just a little differently than we do. And the scholars tell us it's around 457 B.C. He started back on the first day of the first month and got there on the first day of the fifth month. We read in verses nine, or verse 9 of this chapter. This is what's happening. Now, Ezra is coming back for a different reason. Zerubbabel came back to rebuild the temple, which in that case was sort of a spiritual and a physical marriage, if you will, of the two phenomena. You had to build the temple. It's the house of God. It's not like today when buildings don't matter. It was back then the building mattered. And the building was a sign of their loyalty to God. Getting that done was necessary. That's why God sent the prophets to prophesy for them to get it done. It's not like building the walls. When Nehemiah built the walls of Jerusalem, it was for their safety. It was a physical project, but it had some spirituality to it. But Ezra just leads a plain old spiritual revival. He wants people's hearts to be right with God. He brings people back, and there's nothing to be built at that time except the people's commitment to the Lord. There are no structures, no temples, no wall. His emphasis is on worship. His emphasis is on the heart. And some people think that Nehemiah 8 actually fits in here. I don't. But the reason they think that is interesting. Because in Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra is the one leading the people. Gathers them all for this mass uh, event. And he, the event is this. They build a podium for it. They have four or five priests to his right side, four or five priests to his left side. Ezra stands up before all the people and he opens the book of the law of God. When he opens the book of the law of God, all the people stand up out of reverence and respect. When he starts to read, he doesn't read one verse and he doesn't read ten verses. He reads from morning till midday while the people are standing. Now that's a spiritual revival. That's why some people think it fits in here. But there's no reason to think that. You also have spiritual revival at all the time, don't you? The work is never done. Now here's what happens with this spiritual revival in Ezra chapter 7. There are four basic points that tell us about the importance of it and from which we might glean points for the church age, for the church era in which we live. First of all, Ezra's genealogy is rather important. I won't try to read through all the names because I made a joke last week about just making stuff up when I read names. <laughs> I uh, won't try to read through all those names. But there are 16 generations that take Ezra all the way back to Aaron, the chief priest, the brother of Moses. 16 generations that take him back from 457 B.C. back to about 1500 B.C. 16 generations. Someone has commented, and I don't know how much emphasis to put on it, but I suppose after just a little bit of thinking, it seems to be in, in uh, the right direction. Someone has commented that the more generations a genealogy is given to a person in the Bible, maybe the more important that person was in the spiritual history of Israel. He's given 16 generations. A lot of people don't get that. Now when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew, in Matthew's book, taking him back to Abraham in about 2000 B.C., he gets 42 generations, three sets of 14. And there are omissions, just like today, sometimes a father might disappear from the record and a grandfather will raise a child, and so it might be said that that person is the son of, so forth, he's a descendant of that person. Well, there were probably more than 16 generations that took Ezra back to Aaron, more generations than 42 that took Jesus back to Abraham, but the idea of a long genealogy telling us something about a character seems to be bearing out. Then, in the Gospel of Luke, Matthew was written for Jews, Luke was written for Gentiles, the Gospel of Luke goes back all the way to Abraham, but then also all the way back to Adam, whom God created. Jesus could trace his genealogy that far, and I don't have a number for the number of generations, 42 plus many 
at that point. Now, the genealogy gives us some sort of importance, and that goes down through verse 9. Then you have some idea of the preparation of a leader. But before we get to the preparation of a leader, notice something about the genealogy that might be applicable in the church age. In the church age, our genealogies simply don't matter. Our genealogies have one generation. Are you a child of God or are you not? We have the new birth. Nicodemus was a Jew of many generations, but he was told you must be born again, born of the water and the Spirit. Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 29 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, that's the new birth, have put on Christ. Where there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. God promised Abraham that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. If you belong to Christ, then you belong to someone who came from Abraham's seed. You have the genealogy of Christ. You have the genealogy, if you've been born with that new birth, you have the genealogy of the one who has the longest genealogies in the Old Testament, or Old Testament history, the New Testament where they're recorded. You have the genealogy of the one who is the Son of God. You have the genealogy of the one who did miracles. You have the genealogy of the one who was resurrected from the dead. You have the genealogy of everyone that led up to him. Your actual genealogy and bloodline doesn't matter anymore. What matters as far as heaven is concerned is the genealogy that you have with the new birth in the kingdom of Christ. And that puts your genealogy above national allegiance. You can type in genealogy.com and some things and you can, you can get back uh, some different results about whether you're 14% Scottish and 27% German and all sorts of things like that. And that's fun and that's interesting to know. But in the end, if people take that too far, that divides us. Christ was sent to unite us. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It only matters whether or not you belong to Christ. Philippians 3 verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our loyalty ought to be. We're part of the kingdom of God. And then in Luke 14 verse 26 we're reminded that our genealogy, our bloodline ought to be subservient to our allegiance to Christ. Whoever follows me and does not hate his father or mother, wife or children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, cannot be my disciple. Jesus doesn't mean that you turn against your family and you strike them and you do evil things to them, but in comparison with loyalty to Christ, family is nothing. Now that's a tall order, but that's what it means. So if we're talking about genealogy in Old Testament times, making somebody important, let's remember this. It all led to this era where if you simply belong to Christ, you are a priest, you are a king, according to Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. You're part of a holy nation, you're part of a royal priesthood, you're part of a chosen generation. You're God's special people. Secondly then, you had in this revival, if you will, a preparation of a leader. Ezra chapter 7 verse 10 is often used for a three-point sermon, but I'll abbreviate it tonight. For Ezra, here's the reason all of this is happening. Here's the reason God gave us Ezra's genealogy. Here's the reason that Ezra is in this position of leadership that he is now. For Ezra had prepared his heart to do three things. Seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. We need people to seek the law of the Lord. I don't know many people that are doing that nowadays, but we hope and we pray for revival. We hope that people get some sort of spiritual understanding. Maybe these poor children that are being taught so many evolutionary things, so many atheistic things, so many things that they can make choices about when they can't make choices about those things, so many things that are just outside the realm of reality and bucking against the laws of nature, maybe these poor children will raise up a generation that says, you know, we want something better than that. There needs to be truth. I want somebody to prove something to me. I want somebody to care for me. I know that I'm more than just an animal. Maybe we'll have some people that will realize they're made in the image of God. And they'll start to seek the law of the Lord. They'll seek the law, that they, law of the one whom they see revealed in nature. They'll seek the one who's behind all of this. And they'll seek his paths. Maybe that'll happen. 
I'm not ready to give up. I've read some people, some of our brethren, who say, we've lost the culture wars, nobody's ever going to be spiritual anymore. I'm not ready to give up. I'm not ready to. We want people to be able to seek the law of the Lord. We need to show them as much love as we possibly can. But if somebody's going to seek the law of the Lord, what it involves is effort. You don't have to seek anything to be the devil's minion. You don't have to seek anything to, to go to an eternal hell. You don't have to do anything. You just have to go with the flow. But if you're going to seek the law of the Lord, that takes effort. That takes repetition. It requires growth. Maybe we ought to start trying to nurture more people who are young. Nurture them along the way. Counter all the time that they've given to the world with their music and the media and the sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes bad influences of teachers in schools and sometimes bad influences of peers in schools. Maybe we ought to nurture them with as much time as we can possibly give them and encourage them to seek the law of the Lord. Secondly, Ezra set out to do it. Not only, it's not good enough to seek the law of the Lord, you have to apply it to your life. If anyone abides in my word, he is my disciple, Jesus said, and my father will, and I will come and make our home with him. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, John chapter 8 verse 31. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So you have to seek the law of the Lord and then do it. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, Paul said, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul said, I'm going to preach to people. I'm going to tell people what they need to do to be saved. But I always have to be on watch that I'm doing it first. Seek the law of the Lord. Do it. And then his third goal was to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. I can't think of three better things to recommend to anybody. Can you? Seek the law of the Lord. Do it. And teach it. We often apply that to preachers because that's going to be their vocation. Seek the law of the Lord. Do it. Don't mess up there and preach it. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. Go preach it to people, faithful witnesses, who will be able to teach others also. This ought to be the goal of all of us. Some of us want to do one third of it. Now, follow me here for a minute. Some of us might want to just do it without really seeking God's will. We just kind of take in what we hear. and We don't really seek it ourselves. And we certainly never teach it to anybody. Some people with good hearts might do two thirds of it. We seek it, we do it, but how often are we teaching it? Are we taking the opportunities, looking for the opportunities, finding it? We need all three of these. We need leaders like all three of these if we're going to have spiritual revivals. We need to encourage young men to put these things in their hearts so that they can be gospel preachers. We need to encourage young women not to take roles that they're not outlined in the scriptures, but to seek the law of the Lord, do it, and teach it in ways that are appropriate to their friends and personal evangelism. Everybody has a role here. We need not forget when we teach math and algebra and science so that people can get good jobs that the first thing they need to do above all that and give more time to this than everything else is to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and then be able to teach it. That's the only way to get spiritual revival. God's not going to just send His Spirit down and tell us, hey, you're revived all of a sudden. Some people might teach that, but that's not the way it works. The way it works is for those who are left, the remnant, to gather those who might have some open hearts still. And by that, sometimes you mean the young, sometimes maybe some older. You gather them and you encourage them with the love of Christ. Did you see how excited these young people were for Vacation Bible School? Did you see the love that they... They get the love there. They understand that. And they realize intuitively, I believe, that there's something missing when Christ is not taught them in their homes or in their settings, whatever they might be. They realize in sadness. They don't even know what's going on. They can't articulate it. But they see something here that they don't see anywhere else. The kind of love that comes through teaching the gospel of Christ. Oh, if we're going to have revival, we have to have leaders who seek the law of the Lord, who do it, and then who teach it. And then the third thing we need is more blessing from the political leaders. I tell you, as you've heard our elders rightly mention today, we took a major step in the right direction this past week and we still have work to do. And it occurs to me that that's nothing unlike what they faced back then. Look at that timeline. Let me go back to it. Look at that for just a second. 
You got from 536 BC all the way up to almost 100 years later, the people are still struggling to do what God sent them back to do that first 100 years. There were enemies the whole time. There were enemies that rose up, and they're going to be enemies this week. They're going to be enemies against that decision that come up for a long time. They're never going to go away. God's people have to be vigilant. But boy, what a victory. And along the way, they had victories. And that's what makes them the model for revival. That's what makes them the model for rebuilding. So they had their genealogy that shows this leader was important. He prepared himself to lead people. He knew what was right. And then he was blessed. His character must have rubbed off on the king a little bit because there is a letter from King Artaxerxes that is recorded here in Scripture. Not often do you get the official documents of, of an empire recorded in God's holy writ, but here you do. And in Ezra and Nehemiah you do several times, uh, come to think of it. But Artaxerxes writes a letter to Ezra the priest. This is an official letter to Ezra. Can you imagine getting an official letter from one of the highest officials in the land? Well, if you turn 100, you can probably do it. I've seen some of those. But if you don't turn 100, then you probably have something important to do, something important to say, and you're getting a letter. They may be for you, they may be against you, but you're getting a letter. In this case, Artaxerxes' heart, he was no Jew. As far as I know, he was no real religious person. But he saw the need to send the Jews back, and he gave them everything that they needed. I won't take the time to read it all. But you read when you get home if you like, verses 12 down through verse 26, and you see that he gave them finances from the king's treasury. The, the taxes the people have paid are funding Ezra going back for a spiritual revival. The funding then is for the items of the temple that they did not have yet. Gold and silver, he tells them to buy the sacrifices by the bulls, the lambs, and the goats that you might need to sacrifice. And whatever else you need, you might buy it. And then further, he writes in his letter, because back then you didn't just email a letter across the country. Ezra would have carried this letter with him. He writes in the letter that if any of the treasurers along the way of the smaller subsidiary provinces, if any of the treasurers along the way see that you need something, Ezra, that treasurer is supposed to give it to you. So they'd read in there, yep, I'm supposed to give Ezra whatever he needs up to, and the king set limits, but up to these generous limits, you're supposed to give him whatever he needs. He gave him the finances. He gave Ezra the power to set judges over the people to enforce the law of God in verses 20 through 26. He said you need to set magistrates, you need to set judges. Do whatever you need to do to enforce the law of your God and the law of the king. He's not even my God, Artaxerxes says, but you enforce the law of your God and the king and you go forward with that. You have the blessing of the king. The Lord, the king, and the counselors then all blessed Ezra. Look at what Ezra says in verses 27 and 28 to close out chapter 7. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem and has extended mercy to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. So I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. He gave me everything I need. Now i got to gather people. A leader has to be a leader of persons. And then, lastly, the last thing that Ezra needed for this spiritual revival was organization. Not a lot can be done without organization. Sometimes we can be haphazard. Sometimes we fall through on responsibilities. Organization helps get things done. In chapter 8, in verses 1 through 14, you see a great amount of historical exactness. There are several people named, and it says that those people came back with Ezra along with their sons. This is another testament to biblical accuracy and care in accuracy. The people that are mentioned here, the people and their sons, they give numbers for them. One commentator totaled them up to be 1,754 people. Wives and children aren't mentioned here, so it's estimated that Ezra gathered maybe five or 6,000 people to take back with him. Then, in verses 15 through 20, he sees that they don't have any Levites. They have priests, but they don't have Levites. Remember what the difference was? All the Levites were to serve at the temple one way or another, but only the narrower classification of the sons of Aaron 
could serve with the actual sacrifices and the carrying of the Ark of the Covenant. The rest of the Levites would help with the furniture, help carry the other furniture different places, help with the care of the temple, help with the upkeep, that sort of thing. Well, Ezra looks around after they get going and he sees some Aaronic priests, but he doesn't see any Levites. So he sends for them and gets them. He's doing what a leader does. Make sure he has all the pieces necessary for what he wants to do. And then he leads the people in worship. In chapter 8, verses 21 through 23, he tells us how he sat the people down by the river Ahava and declared a fast for three days. And why did they declare a fast for three days there? Because they wanted to petition God. Verse 21, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and our possessions. Isn't that beautiful? I know that's what you want. Wouldn't it be great if more people wanted that? That we just humbled ourselves, opened up this book, and sought the right way for our children, our little ones, and our possessions. How do we use them to the glory of God? Another reason that he sat the people down there for a fast was to ask protection. You'll see in verses 22 and 23 that he says, I was ashamed to ask the king for protection. Why would you be ashamed to ask for the king for protection? Thirteen years later, Nehemiah gets some armies, some soldiers to go with him back to build the walls. Why would you be ashamed to ask the king for protection? Well, he doesn't say, except that he says, I told him that God would protect us. And after I told him that God would protect us, I didn't want to go back and say, we also need your protection. I didn't want him to think any less of God. So we sat there and we prayed for God's protection. And you know what? He protected them. You see how Ezra is getting everything together? Here's the people I have. I know every one of their names. Uh-oh, we don't have any Levites. I'll go get some of those. Now people will stop and worship and will seek from God the right way. And will ask for protection from him. And then in verse 36, he gives some other details about what happens. The king delivered orders to the king's satraps and governors in the region beyond the river. So they gave support to the people and the house of God. Also, they have worship that's... Uh, I skipped over a couple things. In verses 24 through 33, there's accountability. He's a leader. He gets historical exactness. He gets the Levites when they're needed. He has the people worship. And then there's accountability. He tells you in chapter 8, verses 24 through 23, what all the gifts for the temple were, to whom he assigned them, and he made sure he followed through as a good leader to make sure they did their jobs with them. I contend that people need organization like that in order for congregations to be effective Leaders who seek the law of the Lord do it and teach. And leaders who make sure, they don't do everything themselves, but they make sure everything's covered. And they follow up with people to make sure it gets done. That's what you see in Ezra. For revival in our time, we need to teach Jesus Christ because people have one generation of genealogy in him when they're right with him in his kingdom. We all need to prepare our hearts to seek the law of God, to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances and Israel. And we all need to seek the blessing of the Lord and then the king. The king, so to speak, the government, might not be in our favor at any time, but we need to seek the blessing of the Lord. And if there's a conflict, we have to follow the Lord. But other than that, as Romans 13 says, we obey the governing authorities. We don't try to step out of line. We're not trying to be people who are, who are re revolting. We've got to pick our battles, you see. There may be laws that I don't personally like. There may be laws that you don't personally like. But we don't fight those battles unless they're actually against the laws of God. And then if they're actually against the laws of God, we stand. We work within the framework God has given us to work. And then we organize with leadership. And that's the way for there to be revival in congregations, in the church as a whole, worldwide, to change people's lives. That's what we need. I hope and pray that this lesson might be helpful to us. And I hope and pray often for revival. I hope you'll join me. I don't mean some spirit-led Calvinistic idea where the Holy Spirit comes down and does things for people in spite of their free will. I don't mean that at all. And you might even argue with me that maybe it's invalid for me to pray for revival since that involves people's free will. And 
I don't really pray for someone to do something against their will. But I don't know. I still think there's a valid idea in praying that more and more people would open up a little bit to spiritual things and come back to the Word of God. I'm not ready to give up. I hope you aren't either. If you're not a Christian, come to Christ. You may have a great family, but if you haven't been baptized into Christ yourself, you're not a Christian. Confess Christ as the Son of God, repent of your sins, be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you've already done that straight away from Him, come back with repentance and prayer. If we could help you, please come as we stand and sing.